Today's reading is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendour. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Thank you, Penny. Uh, Shall we pray just before we dig into God's word? Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you would give us faith to receive your word. Give us understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As a joke, a school friend of mine once glued a one pound coin to the concourse of Central Station in Glasgow. He then stood back to watch. He was amazed at those travellers who were in desperate hurry to get to their train, but stopped and tried and tried and tried again to prise it off the concrete without success. Temptation is no joke. In this world, we all encounter it. And if we're honest, like those travellers, there are times we can't resist temptation. We don't fully understand its power to distract us, stop us in our walk with God, and at times derail our Christian testimony. In this preaching series that we're looking at up to the summer, How to Live the Jesus Way, we're looking at what the Bible says about following Jesus faithfully. And to do this, we must come to terms with this idea of how we can overcome the temptation that we all face. And there's no better example than our Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to resisting temptation. Now, one question that might be coming into your mind is this. If Jesus is the Holy Son of God, and he is, was his temptation real? Or was it just a gimmick? Did he have some invisibility cloak around about him that his temptations did mean nothing to him? Well, let me say on the authority of God's word that Jesus' temptations were absolutely real to him. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says this, Jesus was tempted in all things, in every way, as we are, and yet without sin. That was the difference for Jesus. The man Jesus was fully God, and at the same time, he was also fully human. In his divine nature, it was impossible for him to sin, but in his human nature, he was tempted just like every one of us are, but he didn't sin. He resisted those temptations. Praise God for Jesus. He is our wonderful example. And from how Jesus faced his temptations, we're going to learn this morning 
how we can overcome our temptations, real that they are. And the very first way that we can overcome temptations is to know our enemy. Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, a barren place, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Did you notice that it's the Holy Spirit of God who leads Jesus into the wilderness for that time of testing? But it isn't God who tempts him. James 1.13 says this, Let no one say, I'm tempted by God, for he himself tempts no one. Now, often God will allow us to go through great trials in our life to prove the genuineness of our faith and to deepen our trust in God. Those times that Maureen has been speaking about already. But the Lord himself is never the source of our temptation. Verse 2 explains that the temptations we face come from the devil. Now, Jesus believed him. And the Bible teaches that the reality of a personal evil, a personal evil spirit called the devil, sometimes called the slanderer or accuser, and how sometimes we can be accused of falling or making a mistake or messing up. Sometimes he's called Satan. That word means adversary. He's against us. He's our enemy. He's the enemy of God and he's the enemy of every person. You know, evil isn't an abstract force. I don't know if any of you like watching Star Wars. It's not something like the dark side in the Star Wars movie. No. The devil and the demons are angelic beings who rebelled against God in heaven. And they are behind the wickedness in this world. But we don't need to fear our enemy. He is no match for Jesus Christ. And he faces the final judgment. However, in this present world, he is powerful and he's cunning. The apostle Peter, who was really close to Jesus, he knew great times of testing in his life and failure too. And as a follower of Jesus, he said this, be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith. Friends, to overcome temptation, we need to know our enemy and his schemes to trap us and to trip us up. We're in a spiritual battle. We must be on guard and be self-controlled. Jesus, with the help of the defensive shield of the Holy Spirit and with the offensive sword of the Word of God, he stood firm and he won. And we can too. Our enemy is persistent. When the devil had finished all this tempting of Jesus, we read in verse 13, he left Jesus until an opportune time. The war in the wilderness was over for Jesus, but yet Satan would return later. And like Jesus, every day we need to resist temptation. So we need to know our enemy. Then we come to the point that we need to know ourselves. We need to know ourselves. At Jesus' baptism, his father gave this public declaration, you're my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus was then led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he spent time alone with his Father, praying and fasting for 40 days, preparing for his public teaching ministry and healing ministry to start. What do we learn from Jesus' temptation right after his Father's endorsement? That we are more vulnerable to temptation after a time of blessing when we're on a spiritual high, when the good times are rolling and where things are going well. It's a fact. At such times, we can be complacent, sit back and relax. And that is a time of weakness. And we all know that we're weaker spiritually, don't we? Emotionally, we're weaker and also mentally, we're weaker when we're physically tired. We're hungry and we're alone just like Jesus in this wilderness place for 40 days. This week I was really moved 
by a news item about a young woman who had a, a good job, but she couldn't afford to rent her own property. She was staying in hostels and other temporary accommodation. Depressed, she said, do you know, for the first time in my life, I thought of stealing some food. My heart went out to her. There are times when we are especially vulnerable and the enemy will seek to exploit that. We all have our own areas of weakness too. There are temptations that are more inviting to me, but wouldn't affect you at all. You'll face temptations which are hard to resist, but I can switch off at Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> now, it's important to say that being tempted isn't a sin. It's only sinful when we give in to those desires. In Jesus' temptation, we see three main ways we can be enticed by sin. The Apostle John describes these in his first letter. He says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's look at these three together. This temptation, this first temptation, was a temptation of hunger for Jesus. The devil appealed to the lust of the flesh in Jesus. He says, if you're the son of God, turn this stone, perhaps it looked round and smooth, like a freshly baked loaf of bread. And sometimes when we're at our weakest, these things, we can almost, it's almost like a mirage. And Jesus is tempted to turn that into bread, to eat it. He's starving. It's 20 miles to the nearest town. So Satan tries to get Jesus to meet his real, real physical needs using his own divine power, but using wrong methods, going against his loving father's will and his father's provision. In response, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 in the Old Testament. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. And in the parallel passage in, in, in Matthew, he says, but by every word that comes from God. Victory for Jesus came through positive obedience to the word of God. We all know that healthy eating is good for us. But when we eat to excess or the wrong types of food, then it can start to rule our life. There's nothing wrong with meeting our physical needs. Good food, shelter, love, friendship, sex. They're all precious gifts from God. However, they need to be met in God's way, not in a quick fix way. When we wait on the Lord, he'll supply our needs. You know, we live in an age that shows little restraint. It's almost considered a right. If they want something, we should have it now. We binge eat. We binge watch the latest box set, don't we? Yet the ability to, to wait, to go without something, it's called deferred gratification. It gives extraordinary benefits to us, including spiritual, physical, and psychological well-being. I wish I'd applied deferred gratification on the donuts last Wednesday night. Jesus' second test appeals to the lust of the eyes. It's a temptation to power, glory, and wealth. Jesus has shown all the kingdoms of the world Satan says, it's mine and it can be all yours, Jesus. If you'll just bow the knee to me. It's a blatant lie because the earth and everything in it belongs to God, not to Satan. The Lord simply responds from Deuteronomy again, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is a temptation to, to love created things rather than the creator to have glory and fame, to control our own destiny, to be our own gods. And it can lead to the attitude of idolizing our achievements, our career, our possessions, our status, and even our family. God gets pushed to the margins of our life or indeed out of our life. It's all about getting our priorities right. In 1924, Eric Liddell, the talented Scottish runner, was ready to compete in the Paris Olympics. 
Then he discovered the heats of the 100 metres, his chosen event, were on a Sunday. He was devastated. All that training, would it be for nothing? His conscience told him he couldn't run. He was a Sabbatarian. He believed Sunday was a special day to be kept for God. Enormous pressure came upon Eric, including from the press, who called him a traitor to his country. But he resisted the temptation to run. God honoured Eric by giving him strength to win the 400 metres race, not his natural event, in a world record time. Jesus, he knew there was no shortcut in his path to rule the kingdoms of the world that Satan promised him. That wasn't the time. The time was ahead for Jesus. The cross must become before the crown for Jesus. It meant for Jesus kneeling in spiritual anguish in the garden of Gethsemane and praying, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And then with outstretched arms, giving his life on the cross. So each one of us, me and you, would come and worship the Lord our God and serve him. Will you do that today? Will you worship God? Will you serve him? The final temptation, the final attack, we see Jesus tempted to test God rather than to trust him. In a vision, he's taken to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem, 450 feet above the Kidron Valley. The devil casts doubt on Jesus' identity. If you're really the son of God, throw yourself off down into the valley and God will send his angels and will catch you. Again from Deuteronomy, Jesus loved that book, I think. He says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus didn't need to perform some public, spectacular circus act to prove who he was, the Holy Son of God, or indeed to get recognition for his Messiahship. Do you know, we face this pride of life temptation too, if we're honest. We're faced to the temptation to make our own decisions without reference to God at all. Then we expect God maybe to fall into line with our plan or indeed pick us up, pick up the pieces if it goes pear-shaped. This is trying to control God rather than follow him faithfully. Sometimes we can even be tempted to abandon our faith. Marie Durand was a devout Christian woman who lived in the south of France in the 18th century. It was a time when Louis XIV made her Huguenot faith illegal. And when she was 19, Marie got married. But soon after, Marie and her husband were arrested and she never saw him again. Marie was imprisoned in a small tower in the town of Aigumort, in the south of France. The cell held 40 women and it was baking hot in the summer and freezing in the winter, intolerable conditions. In these terrible circumstances, Marie taught large portions of the Bible she had memorized to the other women and she prayed with them. She acted as a spiritual leader. Being literate, she wrote letters on their behalf to family and friends. The women were regularly asked to renounce their faith and a simple yes would have brought them freedom from that dungeon. Some in severe torment caved in, but Marie held out. And in, 19, in 1768, 38 years later, Marie was released. During her imprisonment, she'd scratched a single word on the stone walls of her prison resist, resist. And it's still there today if you go to the south of France. What trust in God? What resistance against the enemy? And what a God who has keeping power to help her resist. Finally, we can overcome by knowing our God. Every Christian has all the spiritual resources we need to counter temptation. 
Jesus told his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray, watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Three weeks ago, we learned from the Lord's Prayer. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're asking our loving Heavenly Father to protect us in situations where we might be tempted to crumble. Let's also follow Jesus' example and remind ourselves and remind our enemy the truth of God's word. This is where Bible verse memorization is an outstanding resource. Leanne and Angie shared with the group last week how they have taken time to store God's word in their mind and their hearts or on memory cards ready to use when they need it most, when they come under spiritual attack. What a great resource that is. One lifesaver verse for me from scripture when I'm tested is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You can see it on the screen. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So when I think I'm on my own, Lord, I can't do this. Lord, I need you. This verse comes to mind. Thank you, Lord. I'm not weird. This temptation is faced by everybody. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, that you give me the strength to resist. Thank you, Lord, this temptation won't go on forever. We've seen the dangers of being alone when tempted. Yes, there may be times when we just need to turn and run. Like the Old Testament character, Joseph, who was invited by Potiphar's wife to sleep with her. But sometimes God tests us in our wilderness situation, like a relationship breakdown, a bereavement, a loss of a loved one, or a loss of employment. Yet we're never alone. Like Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit of God with us. Ask the Spirit of God to fill you, to give you the power in those tough times. When we decide to follow Jesus, we are spiritually reborn and we're given the Holy Spirit as a gift to guide us, to help us, to live within us. However, we're still living in these mortal human bodies which are prone to self-centeredness in thought and action. And this internal spiritual battle that's going on in every follower of Christ, the spiritual against the flesh, the spiritual against the human, is vividly and powerfully portrayed by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7. And he's so frustrated. Do you get frustrated when you're tempted and you give in? I do. And so Romans 7 helps us. What a wretched man I am, says Paul. What a wretched man I am. He's so frustrated. Who will rescue me? Then he says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Who gives me victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the one who gives victory. For me, the best encouragement to faithfully resist temptation is knowing that Jesus has been through it himself. Every temptation that's faced him, I face. And also, that he is praying for me right now. He is praying for me. We needn't worry about the attacks because Jesus, our advocate, is more powerful. Who will bring anything against, accusation against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who can condemn us? No one. Christ Jesus who died, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God, is also interceding, is also praying for us. Praise God for Jesus. Robert Murray McShane, the godly Scottish minister said, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. As we 
all seek to be overcomers. Let's realize that we have an enemy, enemy of our souls. Let's recognize our areas of weakness. And above all, let's remember that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is the one who has faced temptation and has overcome. And when we put our trust and faith in him, we become overcomers too. He will take us to the other side. We are on the victory side with Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, keep us strong in the face of trial and temptation that seem too great for us. Teach us to rely on you wholly and let your spirit and your word be our strength. Help us when our faith is fragile, when we are vulnerable, that we may be strengthened against the temptation of unbelief and we want to just give it in. May we wait, Lord, on you for our physical needs. May we worship you alone and trust you in all our decisions. Help us as a church family to pray for one another, to support one another, and to encourage one another to become victorious overcomers each day. Lord, none of us are perfect. We all fail. But we thank you that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just and you forgive us of our sin and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So may we triumph over our enemy through the blood of Jesus Christ and by the confession of our faith. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us. And we thank you that you overcame temptation and you completed your mission of salvation through the cross and the resurrection. And we thank you for the hope of your coming. And until that time, may we have faith in you. Amen.